I got a voicemail from somebody asking me to talk about the transformed wife, a.k.a. Lori Alexander. This is her on screen. If you're unfamiliar, she is a radical, far-right, anti-feminist, traditionalist. I don't even know how to describe her. You know what? You'll find out in a second. Let me just introduce you to her. This came out mid-September 2021. It's bizarre. Just check this out. I was not passionately in love with my husband when I married him. In fact, I didn't really have much feelings of love towards him. I was not affectionate. I didn't like people hugging me, except for my mom. And I didn't like my dad hugging me because I didn't have a close relationship with him at all. Okay, it sounds like she doesn't love her husband. Is that what you guys are picking up or is it just me? And so I wasn't affectionate at all. And then we would go to movies or watch TV shows with my mom and my sisters, and they'd be all bawling their eyes out. And I wouldn't at all. And I, I kind of thought something was wrong with me. Cause it- okay, now this is a post hoc justification. She noticed a behavior that was odd, which is she doesn't love her husband at all, seemingly. And now she's going back and looking at all the other things. Like, you know, I wasn't very emotional when this was happening either. And I didn't usually do this either. This is her seemingly, in my eyes, trying to justify not loving her husband. Well, I'm just not emotional, so it's no big deal. I just wasn't affectionate. I wasn't emotional. It just wasn't the way I was. He wasn't fed healthy food and he ate terrible when I met him. And I was raised on organic health food. So that was our biggest point of contention. I had even told, written him a note saying I could no longer eat with them in the dining commons because I couldn't stand to watch the way he ate. I was Wow, dude, they just were not meant for each other, honestly. If you have a problem as fundamental as I can't stand to watch you eat, and you're, like, young in your relationship, that is a harbinger. That's a harbinger of disaster right there, in my opinion. But, okay, let's keep listening. Now I look back on on that and see how incredibly manipulative that was. I didn't, I just didn't accept him the way he was. I want to change him. And so I was always finding fault with him. Don't pass him by just because you don't have those passionate feelings towards him. Okay, now here is the root of the issue that I have with Lori Alexander. Do I give a shit if she loves her husband or not? No, I don't even know the guy, nor do I know her. Here's why I don't like what she says or does. She's giving advice to young people impressionable people who may not know any better. She is influencing people to make disastrous decisions that will absolutely end in failure and or heartache more often than not. It apparently worked out for Lori. She didn't love her husband, but managed to make it through and and maintain a marriage anyways. Do you know how often that happens? It is obscenely rare. Not to mention the fact that, like, how can you be with somebody, like, in bed? Like, how can you sleep with somebody who you don't like, who you have no feelings for at all, and be happy with that for the rest of your life? She actually addresses that. I chose not to include this video because it gets a little more graphic than I'm happy with, but her advice to that is, just do it. How long is it really going to take anyways? That was her advice. Keep listening. Don't pass him by just because you don't have those passionate feelings towards him. Feelings will come and go. They're a terrible measure of love. Love is defined in God's word in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Feelings come and go. They're a terrible measure of love. What? My feelings have not come and gone for my wife. I love her just as much as I loved her the day that, you know, we fell in love in the first place. The day we got married, I love her just as much that day. If your love is coming and going in your relationship, I would be, I would venture to guess that you don't really love the person and getting married to them is probably a bad idea. And that's the kind of love that you want to have for your husband. Yeah, you know, feelings are good if they're good feelings and not critical and negative and angry, you know, (laughs) but it's not enough to base a a marriage upon. And when you have, when you fornicate before marriage, the whole relationship becomes one based upon feelings and it's so destructive. Dude, citation needed. What, What is she even talking about here? When you do that before marriage, it becomes, 
So in an ideal world, did you just never, ever do that ever at all? Lest the relationship become based on feelings? It seems like that's the risk, right? If you do that in the first place, you risk making the relationship about feelings, right? I mean, she has come out and said that she has never like denied her husband this or whatever. Like I said a minute ago, she says, how long could it really take? Just sit down and do it. That is an unhealthy view of a relationship. Deeply, deeply unhealthy. That's why God wants us to remain sexually pure for marriage. He wants us to only have sex within the bonds of marriage because those bond us together and they're, they're warm, incredible feelings instead of feelings of guilt and knowing that what you're doing is wrong. You quit communicating. You quit. It's just, it just destroys the relationship. It hasn't destroyed my relationship, made it better. I didn't feel any guilt. What are you talking about? Feeling guilt over like getting with somebody. I, I'm not, the dots are not connecting here. I don't understand. I know it's not taught this these days, but it's God's will and it's, it's not taught because it's nonsense. It's non-scientific, and I don't give a shit if it's God's will or not. So anyway, this woman has deep, deep issues, needless to say. Check out her views on feminism. Believe it or not, she gets even more unhinged. Early August 2021. Today's women want equality, and that's what they were taught, to fight for equality. And what has equality gotten us? It's caused the destruction of the family and marriage. Well, I was going to say freedom, but okay. In their fight for equality, to become like men, that's all it means. No, it means to be equals. It does not mean to become like men. They don't, and even men are becoming like women, I guess. <laughs> you know. I, just, I don't understand. What is she talking about? This is complete nonsense beginning to end. She went on this long diatribe about spanking her kids and how she believes that it's for the best and all this other stuff personally i actually did spank my kid when she was little uh, when kylie well when alpha force zero was a tiny little fella i did i did that it wasn't until she was probably three when i realized that that's not the way to go you know maybe even been two i don't remember exactly but yeah not a good way to do it it's not productive it's not helpful it's not scientific it is more destructive than productive. You should not be spanking your kid, plain and simple. There is science to back this up. There are non-violent ways of teaching children this thing or that thing or whatever else. I would never hit my kids. I never abused my children in any way. I never pulled their hair, never slapped them, never bit them, never anything that was abusive. We spanked mostly on the bottom. I'm sorry, you know what, I'm gonna go there. Some people disagree with this. It's abusive. It is. You shouldn't do it. You shouldn't spank your kids. I'm sorry. Not to mention the fact that even if you don't think that it's fully abusive, it can turn in, it can, I'm sorry, it can turn abusive very quickly and very easily. Like I said, I spanked my kid when she was little. I was spanked when I was little, but it wasn't just being paddled in my case. It was like, it, it went a step beyond. It was not good. It was not healthy. It was not helpful. It didn't teach me anything. It didn't, it didn't teach me anything but to be afraid. Unfortunately, that's what these people want to teach. Fear. If the kid fears you, then they will do what you say. It, it's like that's all they really understand is fear. If the adults, that's what they learned about God. You're supposed to fear God. You're a God-fearing person, right? And that's all they know how to teach. Fear. Spanked mostly on the bottom sometimes on the upper thigh and sometimes we spank smack their hand and that was it and we only did it for clear obe obedience we didn't do it often we didn't do it in anger we did it when it was clearly needed well what's your definition of clearly needed i've raised a kid and at no point in time was it ever clearly needed there were always better non-violent alternatives that accomplished the same goals without the violence and they would be crying then we'd tell them okay pick it up and they wouldn't so we'd spank them so it wasn't four hours you know i think one of them was it took about four hours you know I, i'm not even sure on the time maybe it is an exaggeration it just seemed like a long time at that time i don't know if i ever clocked it but we did that until the child picked up their raisin picked up their toys or stopped getting out of their crib
literally just the kid drops a toy. They pick the kid up. They spank them, tell him to pick it up, set him down. So they set the kid, they spank the kid, set the kid down, tell him to pick it up. They don't. They pick the kid up, spank it, set it down, tell him to pick up the toy over and over and over again for four hours. That is abusive. I don't care who you are or anything at all. That's abusive. That's how we did it. We wanted good children. We wanted obedient children. If you discipline your children when they're young, they'll grow up to be disciplined adults. Okay, now she's giving us a series of excuses and justifications. So here's the excuse. We did it because we want them to be well-adjusted adults. That's not how you get a well-adjusted adult. I'm sorry. I mean, you can get a well-adjusted adult while spanking them. I mean, I'm pretty well-adjusted. It's not the result of spanking, but it's possible to do. It does not lead to having a well-adjusted adult. So that's her first excuse. Grow up to be disciplined adults, and they are. And if you asked any of our children if they were abused, they would say, not in any way. I don't care what your children say. It doesn't matter to me. You could smack your kid in the face and maybe they wouldn't say that you abused them. It's still abuse. Doesn't make any difference to me what they think it was because we loved our children. We're not abusive, we're not mean. We're not mean mean or unkind parents in any way. We believe in God, we believe that his ways work, and spanking has been around for generations and generations. Once again, don't care how long spanking's been around. Doesn't make it any better or worse or whatever else. You know what else has been around for generations? Slavery. Doesn't make slavery fantastic, now does it? It's legal in every single state. Once again, slavery was legal in every single state for a while there, right? Or in most states at the very least. Didn't make it okay, did it? And for a reason, it works. Of course, it's probably not going to be for long because we're in such a progressive culture that's abandoning God. Yeah, so she had to take a shot at uh, old liberals, of course. That's Lori Alexander. I just want to introduce you to her because as I said at the beginning, I got a voicemail about... The transformed wife. So let's listen to the voicemail, see what they had to say. Hey, Owen, Guy Young, Brookfield, Illinois. You know, since I've been following your channel, I mean, I'm 69 years old and I recently retired. Nice. So I only really started following you earlier in this year when I had some time since working so much. But I'm, I uh, seen this uh, since I've been uh, YouTube and yours. I'm getting uh, the algorithm for the friendly atheist who lives in my state. Absolutely, yes. Hemant Mete, he's a good friend of mine. But lived in Chicago, and I didn't know anything about him. And I want to know if you've ever seen any of his videos. I would assume he had. 100%, yeah. I've worked with him on various different things before. He's written articles about me, and I've written articles about him. And yeah, totally. We've worked together on various things. We're involved in similar projects. We've worked with similar organizations and stuff. I don't think I've ever met him in person, but yeah, we have worked closely together before. One thing he's concentrating on is a woman called a transformed wife, who's basically uh, a, a, like a, a Stepford wife uh, sp spouting uh, Christian ideals and how women should behave. I want you know, I'd like to see something on your show where you maybe mention this and get off some of her videos or something like that, because uh, she's <laughs> she's pretty bizarre and dangerous. She's like the opposite of the. Uh, uh, What's her name that does the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, satires on uh, Christian beliefs? The, uh, uh, I forget what her name is, but she's, she does some good videos. But this one's like just the opposite. It's called A Transformed Wife. It's on the front from the Friendly Atheist. I'd like to see some things on it. Keep up the good work. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, Transformed Wife is absolutely unhinged. Honestly, I didn't even show the craziest stuff. I just showed whatever I happened to have downloaded onto my computer because I have covered her before. It's been like a, a while, a couple of years. But if you go to my Fireside Chat channel and just search for like Transformed Wife or Lori Alexander or something, it'll come right up. Anyway, yeah, she is another butter of epic proportions, that is for sure. And I appreciate the interesting trip down memory lane going through some of Lori Alexander's stuff because it was disturbing and weird of course <laughs> which is kind of my whole bit you know disturbing and weird or hilarious and sad i should definitely make a graphic that goes on like my my main channel page or something that says something like that hilarious and sad i think it fits my channel as well anyway thanks for the voicemail hello Owen. this is ron of tennessee and um i was going to take the time to tell you that i really like the show i really like the fact that you get all the facts together before you start to say anything 
Oh my God, yes. It literally takes me at least eight hours, sometimes 12 hours to prep for my streams, my Sunday night streams on my podcast or on the Fireside Chat channel. Every hour of a video that you see is a minimum of three hours of work that went into it, not counting prep time and editing and everything else. It just takes forever. But I think it's worth it in the end, so I appreciate that. I'm glad you like it. And um, I really appreciate that. My question is, why does the Republican Party fear Donald Trump so much? I just can't, you know, put my head around why he has so much power over them. Do you have any idea or do you know anything? I would like for you to tell me, you no, know, tell us, what is the pill for Trump? Thank you very much. And again, like the show, bye. Yeah, I appreciate the voicemail. is really interesting. The answer to the question is because Donald Trump controls between 20 and 40 percent of the Republican Party. So if he were to split off and create a brand new party tomorrow called the Patriot Party, he talked about it, he could take with him uh, at least 20 percent of the Republican Party. They would leave the Republican Party behind and they'd start voting Patriot Party, just like that. Which, in my opinion, is what should happen. But you know what would happen if that took place? Democrats would win every election from then on because the Republican Party wouldn't be able to compete adequately with the Democrats. Republicans and Democrats are neck and neck in pretty much every electoral battle across the entire country right now. They're like within a few thousand votes of each other in just about every election. And a lot of that is thanks to things like gerrymandering and various other underhanded, dirty tactics that are technically legal but probably shouldn't be. But if Trump peeled off 20% of the Republican Party never to vote for Republicans again, they would lose every, every election. Everybody would lose every election except for the Democrats. That's why Republicans fear Trump. He controls the party by controlling 20 to 40% of them. He controls the entire thing because they know he's vindictive enough to drag the rest away. On the other hand, that means that mainstream moderate Republicans have the power to wreck Trump's chances of winning any election. There is a massive schism right down the middle of the Republican Party, the moderates and the extremists. And that is why I believe Trump has no chance of winning in 2024. In my opinion, this is a prediction, so... Hold me to it. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I believe if Trump runs in 2024 and actually gets the nomination, I believe that Liz Cheney or some other moderate Republican is going to run independent beside Donald Trump and steal those moderate Republican votes away. And as we know, it doesn't take much to completely cripple a campaign, to take enough votes away to destroy his chances of winning. So in my opinion, even if Donald Trump does win the primaries, he might, he might win the primaries in 2024 when he almost certainly inevitably runs. Even if he did win the primaries, I don't believe he has any chance of winning the general election because somebody's going to kamikaze themselves by running independent alongside him. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Anyway, thank you so much for the question. They said something similar in 2016, so it's probably a little arrogant of me to make a prediction like that. A little a little dangerous, but, you know, you should still vote. Always vote, of course, but that's my prediction, so take it for what you will. The biggest of Chung guy. Hey, Owen, sick with the flu here. Just wanted to ask, how do the, how do the JWs treat the history regarding the leadership saying they agreed with Nazis in World War II era? Good question, matter of fact. Charles Taze Russell was the founder of the religion. He died on Halloween night, 1916, I believe. He was succeeded by a guy named Joseph Rutherford, who basically did a hostile takeover of the organization, which at the time was called the Bible Students. When Joseph Rutherford took over, like, like I said, hostile takeover was not a willing thing. He took over the organization and fired everybody involved, and he went as far as to ban beards because he didn't want them to be reminded of his predecessor, Charles Taze Russell, who had a big bushy beard. So he went as far as to ban beards so people wouldn't be reminded of Charles Taze Russell. Anyway, 
Joseph Rutherford takes over the organization, I think, in uh, between 1916 and 1920, and then renames it in 1933 to Jehovah's Witnesses. Interestingly enough, a little fun fact for you, the Bible students still exist as an organization. They didn't go away after he renamed the organization. He just took all of their assets and properties. Anyway, Joseph Rutherford famously, during World War II, wrote to Hitler, wrote a letter that you can read. It's out there, expressing his support for Hitler's disdain of the Jewish people. No joke. You know what? Give me a second here. This could be interesting. Let me see if I can find it. Hang on. Thank you so much for bringing this up, Biggest Chunk. I appreciate that. It was pretty interesting. So Jehovah's Witnesses were actually the targets in World War II in Germany. They had their own symbol, which is the purple triangle. Some political prisoners had a red triangle. Jews, of course, had the gold star that they were supposed to wear. But leading up to that, Joseph Rutherford expressed support to Hitler in the form of a letter. He wrote a letter to him. I believe that what like the, the purple triangle stuff when they were in work camps and all that, I think that that was in the late 30s, early 40s, and the letter was written from Rutherford to Hitler in 19 in the early 1930s. So it had not reached its peak. The persecution of the Jews and everybody else had not reached its peak yet when this letter was written. It says, this is jwfacts.com. It says, on Sunday morning, October 7th, 1934, at nine o'clock, every group of witnesses in Germany assembled. They prayed for Jehovah's guidance and blessing. Then each group sent a letter to German government officials declaring their firm determination to keep on serving Jehovah. And here's the letter to Hitler. Russell, founder of the Watchtower, was a Zionist and sympathetic to Jews as part of modern day fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Rutherford initially continued such support. R Joseph Rutherford was the guy that did the hostile takeover, but changed by the 1930s to an anti-Semitic stance. So here's what he wrote to Hitler. Quote, Be it known once and for all that those profiteering, conscienceless, selfish men who call themselves Jews and who control the greater portion of the finances of the world and the businesses of the world. This is all calling back to old Jewish conspiracy theories about them controlling the big banks and the media and everything else, will never be the rulers of this new earth. God would not risk such selfish men with such an important position. The Golden Age, 1927, February 23rd, page 343. That's a quote. The reason that it quoted the Golden Age here, the Golden Age was a Jehovah's Witness book. I believe that they pulled part of the letter to Hitler from that book, the Golden Age, which, by the by, I believe is now considered apostate material. If it's found in your possession by Jehovah's Witnesses, then you'll be punished for it. You're supposed to burn any materials from the Watchtower Society that are older than a certain date. Anyway, here's a continued letter. The Jews were evicted from Palestine and their house left unto them desolate because they rejected Christ Jesus, the beloved and anointed King of Jehovah. To this day, the Jews have not repented of this wrongful act committed by their forefathers. In 1917, the Balfour Declaration, sponsored by the heathen governments of Satan's organization, came forth, recognized the Jews, and bestowed upon them great favors. The Jews have received more attention at their hands than they really deserved. Vindication Book 2, 1932. The letter goes on. It was actually pretty long, but you get the idea. Generally, that's what it was about. It was expressing support for Hitler's goals and talking about Jews controlling banks and being greedy in the whole nine yards. So this originally started as a question from a super chatter. How do the Jehovah's Witnesses treat the history regarding the leadership saying that they agreed with Nazis in World War II? The answer to that question is... They pretend it never happened, and you are mandated to burn materials from Jehovah's Witnesses that are older than a certain date, because if it's older than, say, 1930-something or 1950, 1970-something, I don't even know what the date is they set now, it's considered apostate material. You, you're not allowed to have it. Some things you're not even allowed to talk about. It's apostate stuff, so really interesting question. Appreciate it. The biggest of Chungai, and why do you use Christian nationalists as the term for fundamentalist rather than saying Christo-fascist or theocrat, which is arguably more accurate, Imo? Part of the reason that I use Christian nationalist is because they specifically do not like that term. We can look at the things that these people say, the things that these Christian nationalists focus on the most, the culture war issues that they zero in on, and use that as a basis for what they believe to be the most important. 
Later, I'm going to be talking about this guy right here on screen, Mario Murillo. He's he's a Christian nationalist, an extremist, a fundamentalist, the whole nine yards. And he went on this show, Flashpoint, not too long ago to talk about Christian nationalism and their use of the term. Just listen to what he said here. I love to call you names. They say, oh, you're a Christian nationalist. Let me give you a better word. You're a Christian rationalist. Okay, so he goes on to explain why he's right to be a Christian nationalist or whatever. But here's the point. The fact that he's addressing it in the first place is a sign that they feel that it's a bad term to be used against them. They feel like it looks bad on them to be called Christian nationalists. It's sticking. You know, I watch this TV show Flashpoint a lot. I use it as a basis for what culture war issues we should be addressing the most and in what terms we should be using or avoiding or whatever because their reactions to what they say or what we say or whatever else are a fantastic guide to what they think is working the best. So that's generally why I use the term Christian nationalist because they don't like it. They, they want to address the name Christian nationalist. They feel like it's negatively affecting their movement. That's why I use it. In case you guys didn't know, I get on Discord for 30 minutes and chat with people before the stream starts every Sunday. So 8 to 8.30 p.m. basically, I get on Discord in the special events channel and chat with people. If you guys wanted to come to that, you feel free. It's telltaleatheist.com slash Discord is the link to that. So anyway, yeah, check it out. Pretty interesting. All that jazz. Owen, I think your soul leaves your body whenever you talk about Burger King, <laughs> right? Well, I felt like I was making absolutely nothing at that place. I, I was. I was making nothing practically. I was making $5.40 an hour when I first started there. And when I left there, I think I was making $5.75 an hour after like four years or some shit. I worked there for like ever. I did like the people that I worked with. They were pretty cool for the most part. Some of them watch my channel now all these years later. But some of them were real shitheads and the pay was absolutely terrible, and it was hard fucking work. It was really hard. It was difficult to keep up with all that. Like, fast food workers bust their ass. So do servers. Anybody in the service industry or whatever, they bust their ass. I feel like I work constantly, but I'm not really busting my ass. I work, like, between 40 and 80 hours a week, depending on the week. Probably closer to an average of 60 hours a week, but I'm not, like busting my ass i'm taking my time i'm doing it at my own pace as i need to i can stand up and i can get a drink if i want i can eat i can take a short break and go to the park or then and then come back i just have to work late of course but i can do it if i want it's not really busting my ass it's just working constantly there is a difference and at burger king i busted my ass and i worked constantly you know it was rough can testify to that i bust my ass cooking at mcdonald's but it's worth it for me as long as i get paid yeah absolutely i was doing everything that i could at burger king to move up the chain of command i wanted to i was in i was on drive through originally or i was maybe on cash register originally when i was working eventually i went to drive through just taking orders and stuff and i got told a lot at the drive through that i had a voice for radio that i should be like an announcer or something kind of funny how that ended up but eventually i moved back to the kitchen i felt that was kind of a step up even though it was more of a lateral move i felt like it was me moving up the chain and i was really really trying to get hired on as like the manager there like an assistant manager, anything at all. I just want to move up the chain, you know. But the guy there, the, the general manager, was an ex-Jehovah's Witness. He's Pentecostal and knew that I was a Jehovah's Witness at the time and was trying to convince me to leave and just didn't respect me at all. He didn't respect my knowledge. He felt like I was a child and that I would always be a child. And there was absolutely no hope of me moving up. And he hired from outside to fill the missing assistant manager position. So I just never had a chance of moving up because they just didn't respect me at all. So anyways, I eventually moved on to do other things uh, and my life changed and blah, blah, blah. Middle, middle, middle. I'm on YouTube now. But anyway, I'm just I, I understand that industry and it's not easy to do. 
You know, uh, this is neither here nor there, but a while back I realized that the word nuts rhymes with cowboy's butts, and I have been frantically and desperately trying to find some way to come up with a phrase that puts those two terms into the same sentence, but haven't come up with a good way yet.